Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers, of course, for inviting me to this workshop. So what I present today is a joint work with Christoph Schwab, and today is the 3rd of May. All right, so to introduce the model problem for this talk, we consider the standard second order elliptic diffusion problem on a bounded spatial domain. And we assume, um, as usual, that the diffusion coefficient in this problem given by A, that this is given by a random field, and more precisely, we consider the case that the, log, uh, the logarithmic diffusion, so the log diffusion in this model, is given by a so-called Bezos random tree prior. So the Bezos random tree prior is a particular random field which was introduced only last year by uh, Lassas and co-authors in the preprint. And what they did is to combine the well-known Bezos prior from inverse problems um, with so-called Golden Watson tree um, to obtain a random field that is able to present uh, spatial fractal structures. And they used it as a motivation, for instance, to model pulmonary capillaries or dust clouds. However, in their paper, they introduced it for a linear inverse problem. What we are going to do here is, um, is forward UQ, but we use it as diffusion coefficient in a PDE model. And this, of course, poses the first question. It is not clear um, what's the regularity of this coefficient and the associated solution U to the problem, because this log diffusion coefficient will have P exponential tastes, yeah, meaning we don't have any uniform bounds on the coefficient. And furthermore, it's not a priori clear um, how the random tree structure in this coefficient affects the regularity. But I will present results on that later on. And given that we have regularity, we then can, of course, uh, proceed with pathwise approximations to this problem. So our aim here in this, in this uh, talk is that for given realizations of the diffusion coefficient, we want to evaluate um, the solution U or uh, ra uh, randomly draw samples of the solution of U, and then finally estimate quantities of interest with respect to U. And since this is, of course, expensive, the sampling of this pathwise approximations we're going to use a multi-level Monte Carlo approach. But I want to start off this lecture, uh, this uh, talk uh, by the actual construction of this base of random tree prior because this is um, a rather new and non-standard. So as a starting point, um, we consider a wavelet basis on a periodic domain. So we start with two uh, functions, phi and psi, which are compactly supported scaling and wavelet functions, which are at least continuously differentiable and defined on the whole real line. So these are univariate functions, and we also assume that they satisfy a vanishing moment condition. So given these two functions, we are then able to construct an orthonormal wavelet basis of the one dimension of, uh, of the d-dimensional one periodic functions on the torus. And this orthonormal basis, this is constructed by tensorization, scaling, and periodization of these wavelet functions. So we obtain this orthonormal basis, uh, basis Old fast psi here, uh, where the functions are indexed by three indices. So the first index J, this corresponds to the scale of the wavelet. Uh, so we have roughly that the support of a function on scale J is given by two to the minus D times J up to some constants. The second function, uh, the second index K, this is the translating uh, translation index on each given scale. So this index, um, tells you the position of the wavelet function, roughly speaking, on the given scale. And finally, since we consider d-dimensional functions, we also need this index L, which uh, determines the tensor product we use uh, to obtain d-dimensional basis. All right, and um, the idea in the um, Bezos prior, for Bezos prior, standard Bezos prior, is now to use this particular wavelet representation of square integrable functions and to replace um, the coefficients in the wavelet expansion by random variables. And with this, you obtain a random field, which is periodic or which is one periodic and defined on this um, torus here. Yeah? So what you would do is you would consider an IID sequence X, which contain, consists of P exponential random variables. So P exponential means they are distributed with this P exponential density here. So you see for P equal to two, I obtain a Gaussian density. For p equal to one, you obtain a Laplace density and then can uh, obtain all configurations in between. And then the uh, base of prior, this is defined by this series expansion here. So you take this wavelet basis by the functions given of psi, 
you multiply each wavelet function by the corresponding p exponential random variable and you weigh it by a factor 2 to the minus j times some constants and these constants here these are given by s so positive smoothness index s and another positive um, another positive um, parameter p and these two parameters s and p they determine the smoothness of this uh, random function yeah so we, you would uh, use the wavelet expansion of a two-dimensional function and replace the coefficients by this weighted random variables here and the first index so the first uh, factor in this expansion this essentially factors out the weight for the in, in the base of norm and uh, this is why this expansion is also called a bsp random variable yeah or sometimes simply called a base of prior with parameters s and p now it's important to note that these BSP random variables do not take values in the corresponding base of space BS with double index P on the bottom, uh, but rather they um, take values almost surely in the, uh, another base of space BTP, where the smoothness index P is upper bounded by this differential dimension here. Uh, although they call BSP random variable, uh, they take value in a base of space with a, with a lower smoothness. Okay, but this has been introduced some while ago. And now the motivation is to use this construction of a base of prior and to obtain something which can represent fractal structures. And to give you an idea for the construction, um, I will just illustrate it for the one dimensional example. So I've um, plotted here again the series expansion in 1D. So you can see the first index for the scale, this goes from zero to infinity. And then the corresponding translation indices take values from zero to two to the power of the scale minus one. Yeah, so you can actually plot or you can represent the wavelet scales and the translation indices by this binomial tree here. Yeah, so the first index corresponds to the scale. I've plotted this for the first three scales. And then you have the translation on each scale. And of course, the number of uh, nodes in this expansion is doubles on each scale. So what you now would do to obtain a fractal construction is you would start at the root node, so at the uh, root of this tree, and then you go through all skates and eliminate each of the offspring nodes with a given probability beta, which is in between zero and one. Yeah, so just to give an illustration, you go ahead from the root node, and then maybe on the next scale, you, uh, you toss a coin at each node independently and say maybe you select the first, um, you select both nodes on the first scale, then you would proceed with this uh, first node one zero here on the first scale, toss a coin again two times, maybe you eliminate the first node on the second scale, but you keep the second node on the second scale, you repeat this procedure on the right hand side of the tree and so on and so on. Yeah, so you go over all scales, of course, whenever you eliminate a node, um, this branch of the tree is cut off here. Yeah, so whenever you eliminate a node in this process, you don't proceed and go along, you only proceed along the green solid lines here. So you have only one index left on the second scale, and then you toss a coin again and so on and so on. And this gives you a random tree structure. And it's called random tree because each node in this tree is connected to the root node here. Yeah, so you cannot eliminate a node and then start again at the child of this node. So this is why it's called a random tree. And so this was just a construction for 1D. You can easily uh, generalize this to arbitrary dimension, actually. The only thing you have to change is that in D dimension, you have on each scale 2 to the power of J times D translation indices. This means in this tree, each node has not uh, two possible children, but had as has as most 2 to the power of D children. Uh, so on dimension 2, you quadruple the number of nodes on each scale, and in dimension 3, you have the eightfold and so on and so on. So you can uh, use this and what you would do formally here, so I've only, this was only an illustration, so formally what you do is you take these way, first two wavelet indexes, J and K, so scale and translation, and identify it by the nodes of a so-called Golden Watson tree. Yeah? So the Golden Watson tree is this discrete random tree um, where you have a so-called polynomial, uh, not polynomial, but binomial offspring distribution. Uh, this just means that each node can have um, at most two to the power of D children. And since you decide independently for each child and toss a coin, 
this gives you a binomial distribution of the number of offsprings. Yeah. And um, actually, these Golden Watson trees, they uh, have a much richer structure, so I won't elaborate on this in detail, but you can show that uh, the set um, of this random, uh, so that these random trees take values in a polished space. Yeah, this polished space contains of all uh, random discrete trees with no infinite node. And by this structure, it actually sends to talk about uh, random variables in this space because you can assign a sigma algebra. And what you then do to obtain the base of random tree prior is first you sample a regular base of prior B, and then you sample independently such a Golden Watson tree. You go ahead with the random tree construction and you only keep the coefficients that relate to your random tree. Yeah? So you eliminate all the coefficients successively in the wavelet expansion, you can do this recursively. And by this elimination, you eventually get uh, structure fractures, uh, fracture structures of your coefficient. So to give you the formal definition, this was, was, uh, this was introduced by this four authors here last year. So they took the base of prior and replaced the first two wavelet indices, not with the full index set, but only in this uh, set which relates to the discrete random tree. Uh, but you see all the other terms in the expansion are the same. And uh, we also note that the, this elimination process that doesn't affect this tensorization index. So in one dimension, this index L was equal to one. And this new expansion here is then what we call a BSP random variable with wavelet density beta. So this parameter beta represents the density of the wavelet indices you use. And this random field here now has certain, um, certain interesting properties. So first of all, you of course recover the standoff base of prior if you take wavelet density equal to one. Secondly, if this wavelet density is uh, above a certain threshold, so over two to the power of minus D in D dimension, it is actually possible to show that you have an infinite expansion with positive probability. Yeah, so this expansion doesn't cut off after a finite number of terms with positive probability. And if this is the case, your random field forms fractals on the torus, where you can actually quantify the host of dimension of these fractals with respect to this wavelet density. However, if the wavelet density is below this threshold, then it's actually possible to show that you always have a finite expansion here. And then of course you inherit the smoothness of your wavelet functions. Okay. Um, just to show you some example, how this base of priors look like, or this random tree priors look like, I've prepared some pictures for 2D. So we have a two dimensional torus. I've used uh, these parameters S and P also equal to two. And you see the leftmost picture here on the top. There I used a rather low wavelet density of one fourth. So I used the same random numbers for each experiment. And I only increased the wavelet density. I only uh, increased the probability of the coin toss. So you can see here, well, here's wavelet density one third, nothing, not much more happens. But here in the rightmost picture, you already see like first fractal structures forming. And this becomes more pronounced as you further increase this density. Yeah? So here on the bottom, I successively increase the density. And in the final picture on the right bottom, this is equal to one. So this is a standard base of prior here. And now if you take a look at these pictures, remember we want to use this random field as a log diffusion coefficient in the PDE model. So it's of course important to investigate regularity of this random, fract, uh, of this random fields here. And that's actually the first result of this talk. So uh, we took this random tree prior and we quantified its regularity in terms of Bezov and Hölder norms because Hölder norms will be uh, important for the elliptic regularity later. So whenever we have a random tree Bezov prior with parameters SP and beta, uh, where we actually reparameterize the wavelet density beta by such a exponent gamma here, because this is simply handy of, uh, from the notation, uh, the first result is that this random field takes values in the Bezos space BTQ, where the upper bound on T is now given by the differential dimension S minus D over P plus this red term here. And you see here, if uh, gamma is below D, so we have a non-trivial wavelet density below one, then actually we gain some smoothness in this random fields compared to the Bezos prior. Yeah. Um, more importantly, we also quantified this in terms of Hölder norms. And since we use a log diffusion, we want exponential moments of the Hölder norm. 
And this is our main result here for the regularity, actually. So whenever this differential dimension is positive, meaning we have a continuous random field, then we are able to quantify the exponential moment weighted by some epsilon of the Hölder norm. Yeah, so this is the Hölder Sigmund space here, CT. T is upper bounded by the differential dimension. And it's not only the exponential moment of the Hölder norm, but we were able to include, include this index P here. And this is only all, uh, this exponent P here. So this is only obvious for the Gaussian case. Yeah? Then this follows by Fernick's theorem. However, for the general case, this was not proven before. At least we didn't find any results um, that in this generality. So this in particular means that we have a Hölder continuous, um, that we have Hölder continuous random fields, and this we can later use for the elliptic regularity analysis of the, of the solution. Okay, so going back to our model problem, um, I want to make this a bit more precise now. So we consider a domain which is uh, embedded in the d-dimensional torus. So doesn't, we do not consider a periodic problem a priori. We only assume that the domain is in three dimension, convex polygonal in within the torus, yeah, so that we can find the random field simply by restriction on this domain. However, this is not really an, an obstruction here yeah, because we could also expand this um, construction to a larger domain than the one-dimensional torus. Yeah? We wouldn't then have to include more terms, but um, in principle, it would work the, uh, in the same way. So then we consider um, this restricted base of tree prior as log diffusion coefficient, and we assume a deterministic right-hand side just to keep things simple. And um, now the question is, of course, how can we, um, is this problem, first of all, is this random problem to find a solution U to this elliptic PDE is this well post? And if yes, do we have some regularity? And of course, for well postness, we switch over to the weak formulation. Uh, so we introduce the L2 space and the Sobolev space, which contains the Dirichli boundary conditions. And then of course, the weak formulation is given by the usual integration by parts formula. And we were able to show, first of all, this weak formulation is actually well posed. So we have almost surely a unique weak solution. And this uh, regularity of the solution can be quantified in terms of Sobolev norms. Uh, we obtain Sobolev norms here because we have a convex domain. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. For this, we need, exactly. For this, I, I mean, didn't make this precisely, but for this, we assume, of course, that the right hand side is an all right, so by this, we now have well-postness and regularity. And if you want to sample from this coefficient, we have, of course, to come up with a tractable approximation because this is all in finite dimensional as of now. And the first thing to do um, is to obtain a tractable version of this random tree coefficient. And since it's given by a wavelet expansion, it's obvious simply to truncate this wavelet expansion after a finite number of scales. So by this, we obtain this truncated random tree prior here with truncation index n. And then we simply use this truncated tree, plug it in the weak formulation, and then we obtain the semi-discrete problem to find un, where the diffusion coefficient in this problem, this diffusion problem is then simply the truncated, uh, replaced by the truncated prior. And of course, also for this weak problem, we can show in exactly the same way existence, uniqueness, and regularity and more importantly, all the constants here are independent of the truncation index. Uh, so this is important if we want to bound the truncation error later. Okay, so this is still semi-discrete. So the next thing to do is use, to use a finite element discretization in the pathwise approximation. And there um, we also use the, um, like the, the most obvious approach. So we take our uh, domain, it was convex polygonal, and we partition it by a sequence of either simply states or parallelotopes. So this gives us a, tri a sequence of triangulations uh, with a given refinement parameter H. And of course, we have to assume that this um, sequence here is actually non-degenerate. So it consists of admissible triangles or parallelotopes. And we also need to assume some shape regularity. But given that uh, we have such a sequence, we then simply replace the solution space V by its finite dimensional counterparts. So this consists either of linear, piecewise linear elements, if we have simplices in, the domain, in, the, in KH, or of bilinear function, or for instance, of bilinear function, if we use parallelotopes to tessellate the domain. 
And finally, this gives us a fully discrete problem. So where the diffusion coefficient is replaced by its truncated version, and the test functions are, of course, replaced uh, by test functions in a finite dimensional space. OK, so by this, we have a tractable approximation. And now the important thing is, of course, to bound the error here. And this is our next main result. So given that we have um, parameters S and P in a given wavelet density, and we assume here that the right-hand side is in L2, um, and we use uh, the, the two steps of discretization that I just described, uh, we can then show that there are two parameters T and R, and these two parameters, they will actually uh, determine the uh, decay rate of the error. So T will correspond to the truncation error and R to the final element error. And the first, this is why R is capped by one. And so our first result is that whenever P is strictly larger than one, we can actually bound the pathwise error by these quantities here in the H1 norm and in the L2 norm. Uh, so we have two to the power of Tn in both cases for the truncation error and H to the power of R in H1 and H to the power of two R in L2 and the moments of these errors. So these error bounds are in the Qth moment where Q is arbitrary large. Uh, and this holds whenever the uh, P of the P exponential is um, strictly larger than one. So whenever we have a diffusion coefficient, which has um, tails which decay faster than exponential, a log diffusion, 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 uh, log diffusion coefficient, but tails decaying faster than exponential. So then we don't have any restrictions on the moments. Um, you can also show this in the case where you set P equal to one. So in this borderline case, then this Q here, this integration index, this is upper bounded. And this upper bound, this depends on the scale parameter of your P exponential density. Uh, then you get a restriction on the moments, but in principle, um, the estimates hold, uh, hold nevertheless. All right. So now we have a pathwise approximation. Our ultimate goal is, of course, to estimate a given quantity of endless psi of the solution. Yeah, and then um, here it's also important to note this psi can be a nonlinear functional in our analysis. And then, of course, what we do is to use the multi-level Monte Carlo estimator. So we fix a maximum level L. So capital L is the finest level of approximation we're going to use. And we consider, of course, then a sequence of approximation where we adjust the truncation index and the finite element refinement for each, um, for each L in the, seat, in the sequence. So we have a sequence of refining approximation and the approximated quantity of interest is denoted by Psi with sub-index L. And then we use the usual telescopic expansion um, to obtain a multi-level Monte Carlo estimator. And the number of samples on each level in this multi-level estimator, this I will denote by ML. Yeah, so this is what you all know, of course. All right. And by this approach, so this is my final theoretical result in this talk, um, we are actually able also to bound the complexity in terms of, of a given uh, target accuracy for this multi-level Monte Carlo estimator and the forward problem. So for this, we need to make a few assumptions. So first of all, um, since this quantity of interest psi this was given as nonlinear, we have to assume that first of all, it's defined as functional on a suitable Sobolev space H theta, where theta is in between zero and one, and that it's furthermore has polynomial bounded Frechet derivative. Yeah, this is simply to obtain a polynomial bound that with which we can work. In the next step, we assume that our pathwise discretization errors with respect to the H1 and the L2 norm hold for given parameters T and R. But this is, of course, um, given by our previous analysis. We, here we have some restriction on the Q, so we need that Q is sufficiently large, depending on the bounds of Psi and larger than, especially larger than two. But again, this is only a restriction if P is uh, equal to one. Yeah, if P is larger than one, then um, this is, um, this is always given. So, and then for a given, we also need to um, assume that a sample is realized in complexity uh, HL to the power of minus D. And then for given epsilon, we have that the mean squared error is bounded by um, a constant times epsilon and the asymptotic complexity is given by these three estimates here. So these are the usual three cases you have in multi-level Monte Carlo. Um, 
since I'm out of time, I will skip the numerical experiment because there's one point in the conclusions I would like to make. So by this whole construction, um, we defined this random tree model by this discrete random trees, which is not a priori a Banach space, but only Polish. It is positive to write the entire thing here as a parametric PDE. Yeah? You could parameterize this in this product space domain here. However, this parameterization, this will be discontinuous. So the map parameter to diffusion coefficient is discontinuous, which means, uh, so I think actually that multi-level Monte Carlo is the best you can do, yeah? because higher order methods as quasi Monte Carlo, they are out of reach because of this discontinuity here. Furthermore, this also obstructs a weak error analysis where you would need to use Taylor approximations. So um, if you have any ideas how to resolve this, um, I, I would like to discuss this. Okay, but with this, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.